Well, correction, I do like static target R, but I love teasing DevRim about it. That's yeah. the most important part. Anyway, um, I'm here as an employee of EDB. I do work on Postgres. I'm a committer, contributor, and so on. And I'm here actually to talk about Postgres and how it performs on different file systems. Um, I do have a quick agenda here. Uh, I'd like to mention that this is like not extremely uh, detailed talk. In like, I'm not going to talk about internals of file systems. My primary goal when I started doing these benchmarks, and I do these benchmarks especially to inform me and myself, uh, was the question like, is there any significant difference between the most commonly used Linux file systems uh, when you run Postgres on top of it, right? I mean, like, because I get asked about that quite a lot, right? People ask me, like, should I run on ext4 or should I run on ZFS or whatever, right? And I'd like to have some basic insight, like intuition, like, is it much slower or faster? Like, what are the benefits and so on, right? Like, I'm not going to talk about like data corruption and this thing, um, at least not in much detail, but my primary goal when I started doing this was like a black box testing, and I'm here to share some basic understanding of like what I think uh, uh, I can recommend and uh, um, like insights into which file system is um, like better for which use cases, right? And uh, so at the beginning of the talk, um, I'm going to very briefly explain like why Postgres relies on file systems and the kernel uh, to do the stuff. And then we will go to like a very basic um, summary of the test that I did, right? And I will also briefly um, mention during the talk like the options, like what could we do differently in Postgres, right? So, um, by the way, if you have any questions during the talk, um, I'm happy to answer them um, during the talk, so just shout. Um, also, uh, the next talk, um, I'm not sure if which room, is actually about the future of Postgres IO that Andreas Freund is actually working on, right? So it might be like a natural follow-up to like this motivation. So um, the, the th basic things I have considered when doing these benchmarks is like um, which file systems, right? So, and I decided to limit myself to the most common ones, right? Like it's ext4, xfs, zfs, and btrfs, because those are simply the most commonly used production systems, right? Um, there are many other um, file systems. I'm not saying they are bad or anything like that, but I think this is like a basic um, representation of what the default file system probably are, right? Um, I also looked a bit like, should I use LVM for snapshotting or should maybe I use the snapshots that are built into uh, BTRFS and ZFS? Um, what about snapshots? What about compression? Uh, I will talk a bit about these things. And uh, just to give you a very short like summary at the beginning, like th there's no clear winner, right? Different file systems are useful for different, uh, different uh, uh, workloads. And what I would generally suggest is that you prefer file systems that are actually default and like su well supported by the distribution that you use, right? Which most data um, distributions support like ext4, xfs, btrfs, and fs, right? So whatever is like actually operational, like acceptable for you from uh, operational standpoint, that's a good choice, right? If, if you have a perfect file system, but no one is able to give you support for that if something breaks, um, that's actually not very useful for production workloads, right? Uh, if you use something no one else uses, even if it's like great, again, you will be the only ones actually running into problems. So um, that's the first recommendation I would give. The other recommendation uh, I would give you 
is to use recent kernels, right? I mean, like, just like with Postgres, we tell people to maybe eventually migrate to um, a recent release because there are many improvements, fixes, and so on. The same thing applies to kernel, right? So if you are still running on like four dot something, I mean, like, I agree that's very stable, but also it's missing a lot of like improvements in recent versions, right? And it's not just about like performance improvements, it's also about correctness. I will briefly mention the, um, the problem we had like, with F-Sync a couple of years ago. And if you don't have like a recent uh, kernel version, you might actually suffer data corruption because of that, right? There are probably many other data corruption issues that apply to all the file systems, right? Like um, a couple days ago, we had a, a data corruption in ext4. Two weeks before that, it was a data corruption case uh, in ZFS. Um, you need uh, these fixes, right? The other, like when it comes to the actual file systems, I would say that the ext4 XFS are a great choice for the basic file system use cases, right? If you don't need the advanced features provided by ZFS, BTRFS, if you don't use, um, uh, say, snapshots regularly to do stuff, then this is going to be um, like the fastest uh, option, right? Because the file system simply do less things, they can do that more efficiently, that's what I would do. And between ext4 and xfs, really, um, th th there are differences, maybe there is like 10% difference, but it's not something that I would worry about very much. It's something that you can probably solve easily by buying a bit better hardware or something, which is like, yeah, it's more money, but it's not like a, um, you know, a 10x difference, so it's manageable. And also, I did some basic tuning, but I'm pretty sure that if you do additional tuning on the file systems, you can probably get them closer, right? And um, ZFS and BTRFS, if you don't need snapshotting, and this kind of like uh, benefits, um, they will be much slower, right? But if you need those snapshots, it's usually much better to do them using ZFS and uh, BTRFS, using the built-in uh, infrastructure, compared to doing snapshots using LVM, right? So that's like the basic intuition I have after doing these benchmarks. So um, the first thing I would like to briefly talk about is like, why does Postgres actually rely on operating system to do a lot of stuff, right? Because um, it's just another layer, right, in, like, in, in that, right? So, um, and when you add another layer of indirection, that means, like, you will be facing problems um, because of that, right? Um, the simple, simple view on that is that Postgres is a database, right? It's um, the whole point of doing, using Postgres is to store data and manage data and process data. Uh, but we kind of leave the low-level stuff, actually s managing the, the devices and like mapping um, memory onto disk blocks and so on. We leave that up to the operating system. Um, um, so the, whenever there is like a need to do I/O scheduling or EVIC stuff from page cache to, to disk, it's done by the operating system. This also involves things like handling errors, right? Um, why do we do that? Well, the first thing is that, uh, like, th there are historical reasons for that. Um, the main reason, I think, always was like a, a limited development activity, um, capacity, right? But, like, we have a certain number of developers, um, so, and we want to focus on doing the database stuff, right? We do not want to sub, um, do, like, um, implement new file systems, 
because that will just like mean we do less of the relational um, stuff. It's a distraction. And it was definitely true when Postgres started as a university project, and it's still true now, because I'm not sure that we could actually um, you know, outcompete the file system engineers, because the tendency is to see the other layer as something very simple. But the truth is, actually, file systems are like damn difficult, right? Because they do need uh, to interact with the hardware. They do need to s uh, handle errors that we haven't even thought about. So I'm, I'm glad we actually leave that to the operating system. Um, I'm not even sure we actually will ever have the capacity, right? So uh, how does actually Postgres use uh, the storage? Well, we have, um, you know, this part is managed by Postgres. So that's like background processes, uh, backend processes and the connections, there are shared buffers. Um, but all of that actually is ultimately accessing page cache. Um, by the way, the, f the slides will be available. I have already uploaded them, so um, you, you don't need to take photos unless you actually want to. Um, so all these bits are accessing the page cache. Um, th there are a couple cases where you actually use direct I.O., but I will ignore that here. Um, and then the f file system, including the page cache, is managed by the kernel. Right? And the kernel takes care of like hardware interfaces, the different file systems, um, I.O. scheduling, and so on, which ultimately goes to the actual physical uh, storage devices, which might be either attached directly to the, to the hardware or uh, to network or something. Right. So, so that's it. Um, but there are a couple, <coughs> couple problems with this, right? So I already mentioned like um, the F-Sync gate, which was in like 2018, uh, and there was a problem with um, insufficient handling of errors and communicating them incorrectly to the user space applications from the kernel, right? Um, which kind of like illustrates that POSIX is great, but it's like um, just API specification. It's not perfect. It's not, it doesn't cover all aspects of, uh, of the problem. Um, and the F-Sync, for example, was related to multiple things, right? Sometimes we just didn't realize that F-Sync failed, and we just retried. And there's, that's not specified sufficiently what should happen then, right? Th there are differences between the file systems and quite annoying ones, right? So some file systems just fail, right? They will report error. Some file systems just ignore the F-Sync the uh, error and just declare that um, the the buffer is clean, right? So we kind of like, it did work until the restart, right? And things like that. That should be fixed now in new kernel versions, but it's an illustration that you should use the new kernel, and also it's an illustration that there are actually problems um, that we don't know how to solve, right? So th those are problems in, in the, the path managed by the kernel. The other problem is um, like more conceptual. It's not about handling errors, but it's actually doing things more efficiently, right? I mean, like when we use the, um, the, uh, the kernel uh, and file systems, we just essentially write stuff to kernel and then the rest is up to the kernel, right? The kernel, however, doesn't have an insight into like, um, which of those requests have higher priority, right? So for example, the database knows that some requests should be handled um, immediately, while other writes, for example, can wait and be done in the background without interrupting the user queries, right? So that's something that is really difficult to do when you just rely on uh, the buffered I.O. And it's also part um, uh, of the reasons why I think Andres is working on the uh, asynchronous I.O. and direct I.O., right? Um, one example is, uh, well, I already mentioned the first example, which is like the difference between what can be done 
in the background and what needs to be done immediately. The other example is like prefetching, right? So for example, when you are scanning data through indexes, for example, uh, using the bitmap, uh, bitmap index scan, what we currently do, we actually need explicit code to prefetch data in advance, right? Because the, the read ahead doesn't work for this case, right? This is more like a random I.O., random jumps. So we need to actually explicit code for prefetching because that's just information that only the database knows. So uh, those are things. Uh, uh, those are the basic features of, of this. So the basic rule here is you should use um, um, sufficiently recent kernel. And I use like 6.3 something in those benchmarks, which is not that old, which is like reasonably new. Otherwise, you might have like uh, performance problems. You might have some of the data corruption issues. Um, right. So the next part is actually about the benchmarks that I did, right? And you can actually find the results and like many more charts that I will present here um, on my GitHub. And I'm, it's the raw data is like gigabytes but I'm willing to share them if you are interested. Um, so the first rule here is that uh, when the system is not under load, um, like everything performs fine, right? It's like that's not the case that I'm, I care about, right? I care about the case when the system uh, gets saturated in some sense, right? Either you hit like a bottleneck on the CPU or you hit a bottleneck on the I.O. because then the differences start to emerge, right? Yeah, so that was kind of like a joke. But um, so the benchmarks or like the tests that I did are more like a stress test, right? You essentially run the system up to the limit and uh, then you will see like the different behaviors. It's not entirely uh, realistic because Usually in production, you will not wait uh, for the system to hit 100% utilization on any bottleneck, right? Uh, you will usually see like a degradation of performance, um, maybe not in throughput, but definitely in latencies well before that, right? So this is a bit like extreme example. Uh, I think in, in theory, you should probably aim for something like 75% um, of throughput, and then when you reach that uh, on production for like extended period of time, it's definitely time to upgrade, right? Because it doesn't give you any slack, right? So for example, when you when your system can do hundred thousand, yeah, uh, when your system can do hundred thousand TPS, maybe uh, monitor for like seventy five thousand, and then it's time to upgrade or like increase the capacity in some sense. All the benchmarks that I did here are on the systems that I usually use for benchmarking. So it's like mid-size system uh, with uh, maybe two, uh, two sockets, uh, 32 CPUs, um, I don't know, 64 gigabytes of RAM, um, NVMe drives. Um, I also used a smaller system which only has like a, um, you know, SSDs attached to uh, SATA, so like older SSDs, just to see the difference in behavior. Um, but that's kind of uh, the point. I'm well aware that some of the file systems, especially ZFS, for example, is designed with a lot of flexibility, right? So, for example, you can have uh, some of the parts of ZFS on like a dedicated um, uh, device or something. I didn't do that, but I know that it can actually have a significant improvements, uh, significant benefits, right? So I try to do like apples to apples comparisons. Right, so um, ultimately what I ended up doing is like two types of benchmarks, right? So first one is like a bulk like all up style analytics uh, with like a large data load uh, 
In this case, it's just a simple PG bench in it with um, fairly large, um, uh, fairly large scale. In this case, it's like 2,000, which means uh, um, it's like multiple of the amount of, of RAM in the system, right? So it's like I/O bound usually. And um, in this case, it's like the larger system. It's like I don't know, uh, 160 gigabytes of data after loading, right? And I did like multiple benchmarks or like di different combinations, many more than is like visible here. This is just what I think is interesting, right? These are timings in seconds, by the way. So, the, you know, the shorter the better. And if you do just, you know, the, the basic um, loading on without anything else, um, you can see that most of the file systems are, perform almost the same. It's up to here, right? Um, there's not much difference between ext4, xfs, and btrfs. ZFS is slower for some reason, right? I'm not sure why. Um, but um, this is the PG bench. Then this is on the on the machine with six uh, SSDs. So if you switch that from you know LVM on software RAID to like the native multi-device uh, configuration with BTRFS, it doesn't actually change anything. It's like sequential writes are very efficient anyway. Um, ZFS also doesn't change very much. But then I ask like myself, like, why am I even comparing like, you know, um, ZFS and BTRFS without using any of the features that uh, those file systems actually provide? And that's, so I started doing some snapshots, right? So I created the, the file system and I created the snapshot every five minutes um, keeping like three snapshots at a time, right? So you create a snapshot, after five minutes you create another one, um, and then when you have like four, you start dropping the older ones. And then obviously that is more work for the file systems to do, so it can't be faster, it needs to be slower, right? That's natural. So if you do that with uh, LVM, you can see that it actually gets much slower, right? Like, so it's like, in, instead of like three, uh, sorry, five minutes, it gets, uh, I don't know, 20% slower on uh, all the file systems. However, with ZFS, uh, it didn't change. And also, when you actually start using the native snapshots with ZFS, uh, it remains about the same. Um, the point here I'm trying to make is that if you use snapshots, with ZFS you will get this throughput, essentially. But if you use LVM snapshots with EXT4 and XFS, it's going to be slower, right? So that's, that's the benefit of actually using copy on write file systems, with, at least with bulk, uh, uh, bulk loads and whatever. The, however, this was like not very fast, uh, storage system, right? This is like the regular uh, old S, uh, SSDs. If you go to the new file system, uh, to the new machine with like NVMe SSD, which is like much faster, you can see that the, the differences are like way more pronounced. So um, the native, like it's a single device, so there's nothing like software, right? But if you use like the regular file systems, um, Without any snapshots, it's well, roughly the same. ZFS is slower, of course, um, a bit. But then once you start doing snapshotting, ZFS actually, you know, um, keeps the performance roughly. Like, but the LVM snapshots are like, I don't know, multiple times slower, right? Because simply the bottleneck that the LVM is hitting for some reason, and I haven't inspected what it is, um, is, well, significantly affecting the performance. So this essentially is, is the point uh, that if you don't need the uh, advanced features, these file systems are like fine. If you need snapshots, if you, if you plan to use snapshots, um, well, 
these things are better, right? Because they do have actually the snapshots designed from the very beginning, right? They are designed to do that. Um, I also did um, a benchmark, oh, sorry, I also did like a PG dump to, sh to see the, the opposite direction, which is like a bulk dump, like reading a lot of data. The story is like essentially the same, except that the snapshot do not matter, right? Because that's read-only operation. So um, again, um, the regular file systems and also ZFS perform roughly the same. So now, what about actually the, the other spectrum of the workloads? Because this is like very simplistic analytic, uh, analytics workload, right? Like bulk loads, uh, bulk reads, that's it. The other extreme is OLTP, which just means like doing a lot of tiny transactions, um, random reads, random writes. So for the read-only PG bench, um, it seems uh, very similar, right? Um, ZFS is slightly slower. I don't know what exactly is causing that, uh, but the, at least on the small machine, the performance of the, you know, the native Linux file systems is roughly the same. On the larger machine, the differences are kind of like more pronounced. And this is again the largest scale, right? So it's like a multiple of the, uh, of the memory. So it's actually hitting I.O. Um, and here the, um, the uh, copy on write file systems are kind of like slower, right? But BTRFS and ZFS is performing roughly the same. Again, if you need snapshots, this is kind of like irrelevant, right? Because uh, you will not get that feature, uh, but this is only read only. So what about read writes? This is where I did not just you know, the large scale, but also tested with like small data sets. I usually do tests with like three basic sizes, which is like fits into shared buffers, fits into memory, and like much larger than RAM, just to hit different types of bottlenecks in the system. And um, on the small system, it's like PG bench uh, 100, 500, 2000. The basic rule for PG bench data sets is that if you multiply the scale by 15, you get roughly the on disk size of the database, right? So it's like 1.5 gigabyte, I don't know, five gigabytes, um, or maybe a bit more, um, and uh, like 30 gigabytes of data. And you can see, again, that's roughly what we saw before, right? All the file systems perform about the same. Then ZFS starts to lag a little bit. On the large, uh, larger machine with the NVMe drive, um, and by the way, it's like um, um, data center uh, quality drive. It's not like uh, regular consumer drive. Um, the differences are, again, like more significant, right? Like EXT4 and XFS, that's the red and orange here, uh, perform almost exactly the same, which is why I said like there's not much difference between them. I will talk about that uh, in a bit. Um, and the copy and write file systems actually uh, um, are a bit slower, right? And a bit, I mean like uh, one third for BTRFS, uh, and maybe 30% slower on, uh, on ZFS, except for the largest um, scale, which is like larger than RAM, where both of the copy and write file systems are much slower, right? But this is just a throughput, right? It just tells you like how much stuff can we do per second, but that entirely ignores the, the problem of latency, right? Because if you can handle uh, a million requests per second, but each of them takes one hour to actually process, right? Just waiting in some queue or something, or the, the latency is entirely unpredictable and some requests take like one millisecond and some take one second. 
it's very difficult to use that from like especially user facing application right because whenever if the application needs to hit multiple times the database uh, then ultimately uh, it will hit one of those slow cases right so the latency matters and for that reason uh, well that's what I'm talking about but for the reason I'm actually going to show you charts like this right and this is um, a visual thing that you, sh you shouldn't try to understand the exact individual charts, but each column is essentially one file system, and the rows are the different scales, right? So for example, all these charts are throughput uh, on a two-hour test for ext4, xfs, btrfs, zfs, this is the smallest size, this is the medium, large, and large read-only. Right. The, the gray is per second throughput, and the red is like averaged out to you know, smooth it out a bit. So from, I, I find this very useful for like visual comparisons of the behavior over like a two-hour test. Because you immediately see that ext4, xfs perform almost exactly the same. Because you know the lines are nice and smooth, almost. Um, the gray uh, is a bit like wider on xfs, so there is a bit more jitter or like uh, fluctuations in the throughput. But otherwise, I think it's like almost exactly the copy, almost the same behavior, right? And then on BTRFS and ZFS, you can see that it, uh, the scales are almost uh, are exactly the same on all the charts. So we can actually compare them just visually, right? So you can see that BTRFS is like slower, right? Because instead of like, I don't know, 60,000 TPS, it does only 40,000 TPS here. And you can see that here, it's not just slower, but also it you know, changes, like fluctuates, much more. And again, on the largest data set, it actually drops down quite significantly, similarly to ZFS, except that ZFS is much smoother, right? It's like it's more, much more consistent behavior. Um, but again, much slower. So I promised I will show you something about latencies. But this is just throughput, right? Um, so that's the other chart I'm going to show. And those are, that's exactly the same set of tests, exactly the same idea of, uh, of uh, you know, comparing visually, visually the, the different runs, except that instead of throughput, I'm showing percentiles of latencies, right? And ideally, you would like to see something like this. You would like to see something which is very consistent, the latencies, the, the percentiles, and that's like 25%, uh, 50% me, uh, median, uh, 75, 95, 99, right? So it's like the basic percentiles. And this is what you would like to see. It's a very, very consistent, very smooth, very predictable behavior. Uh, for the smallest data set, that's not a surprise, right? Because the application, oh, sorry, the database only does occasional writes at the checkpoint, right? All the writes essentially happen uh, in the background, except for the transaction log, which is written sequentially. So that's very nice. Well, BTRFS handles it pretty well too, uh, except the latencies are a bit higher, which is expected because it needs to do some copy on write stuff, I assume. Uh, ZFS also, except that there is like a little bit more latency spikes right here. Um, similar story on the medium size data set, similar story on the largest scale data set. There are some hiccups on the file systems um, here, right? Like short spikes of the 99% uh, uh, percentiles. It's very smooth on the read-only test, right? The last one is the large uh, read-only test. And that's very smooth everywhere, except that ZFS is like 
doing worse for some reason. What is really annoying on this, uh, however, is what BTRFS does here, right? I mean, like that's, that, that's the latency that you do not want to see on, uh, on production system, right? Because that's exactly like the, you know, that's like a house um, on, the, on the storage. I don't know why it's behaving like this. Uh, I, however, uh, need to mention that this is actually much better uh, behavior than I observed like a couple, couple years ago uh, when there were actually periods of like significant drop of throughput to like zero, right? So um, still, ZFS is also a copy on write file system and it performs, I think, uh, much more consistently, right? Even though, as we have seen on the previous slide, you know, the throughput was um, still a bit, you know, jittery here. So um, on, on the GitHub, there is like many more of those charts, like comparing like cases with uh, uh, compression and like disabling full page writes on, on ZFS and things like that. Uh, I think I also have uh, a couple slides in the uploaded version at least. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, similar results for the smaller system, right? From the, from the um, older SSDs, um, but the conclusions are essentially the same, right? So, what I found doing this um, is that we sh we still shouldn't uh, forget about the important tuning advices for like tuning the page cache, right? As long as we will be using um, uh, the kernel to evict stuff that we have written to page cache, we need to be careful about um, how much dirty data can actually accumulate in, in the page cache. Um, I think, yeah. Uh, so that's the first uh, uh, thing, and that's the configuration parameter, like dirty background bytes or like uh, similar uh, similar thing, and the the, con uh, the behavior, the difference in behavior is illustrated by this. This is just ext4, and this is with like um, 32 megabytes, and this is one one gigabyte, right? So you can see like the throughput, the total throughput is very similar. Uh, like the red line is almost like the same place, but you can see that the latency, uh, sorry, the the truth would like fluctuates much more here. And the similar thing applies to the latencies here. Uh, the latencies are nice and smooth here, but as we increase the size of the data set, and we need to do more and more random writes and write more stuff to the page cache, the latencies actually like get really, really ugly here, right? So this is important to actually uh, still to do. Um, the other thing that I think um, is useful is to disable full page writes on ZFS, which as far as I know is safe on ZFS because it doesn't have the problem with torn pages. Uh, unfortunately, the other file systems that actually rely on, uh, on page cache uh, can't do that, right? ZFS is kind of like exceptional. It doesn't actually use the page cache uh, directly. Uh, right. One thing I mentioned earlier is that when I did, when I did um, the tests with uh, the bulk operations, right, I only showed you the results for the, for the write phase, um, for the PG bench in it. And I mentioned that uh, when I did PG dump, I didn't see much difference between the different file systems. That's not quite true. Actually, what I saw is that ZFS was like twice slow, right? Uh, and I believe that because uh, the, the prefetching for like a read ahead on ZFS either doesn't work well enough or I didn't configure it properly, I don't know. Um, I think uh, that needs improvement. I, I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, but that's what I saw, right? So what about snapshots? This was all 
um, with just uh, uh, with just uh, you know loading data into the file systems without any snapshots, except for the first slide, right, where I showed like well, uh, the the PG bench in it. But once you start doing snapshots, actually it does actually have a significant impact on on the file systems. So for example, um, when you do uh, snapshots on ext4, which has to do LVM um, because it doesn't do snapshots internally, then it behaves like this, right? Like you can see there's suddenly significant spikes because every five minutes a new snapshot gets created that forces LVM to copy stuff. BTRFS is like not as spiky but slower. Um, but this is when you do snapshots on LVM, right? BTRFS on LVM doesn't make much sense or is a bit strange. Uh, when you start doing snapshots uh, using like uh, um, the built-in copy on write infrastructure, it gets much better, right? Still probably not as, um, as nice as we would hope, but it's like much better than this and it's kind of like comparable to ext4. ZFS, of course, uh, uh, is also a copy on write file system. Um, I do only have results for the native snapshotting. Um, and it, at least in some cases, it outperforms the, uh, the PTRFS, right? So for latencies, it's like similar story to before. Um, not great here. Those are the spikes that we saw when creating snapshots. Um, that's pretty pretty nicely visible here. Uh, for BTRFS, the latencies uh, are much worse, at least here, than uh, ZFS, right? So, um, I'm almost at the end of the talk. Uh, uh, the first question is like, uh, when I've been talking, uh, I've been doing these benchmarks, it's like, how much can we actually get from NVMe, right? Because these results were, for me, a bit disappointing. The, there's a very nice paper uh, from VLDB, which is explaining how to do, um, uh, how to saturate NVMe, what, what does it actually take, right? And uh, unfortunately, for each request, Postgres does a lot of processing, like it uses a lot of CPU and so on, so we are far from saturating NVMe. I think uh, that's one of the points, um, one of the benefits of like using the async I/O or uh, moving to like thread-based uh, and async uh, uh, execution, uh, that we could actually do something like is described in this in this paper. I highly recommend reading the paper. Um, it's very revealing um, about that. Essentially, it's describing like uh, thread per core uh, architecture, which is used by many existing applications, uh, databases. And it's, I think, um, one of the options Heike uh, mentioned yesterday on his threading, threading talk, right? So in the future, I mean, like, I do these tests to learn something myself. It's like, it's not primary goal uh, is not to give talks at the conferences, right? Um, so I'm asking myself uh, questions based on this, like how would this actually work on like different hardware, right? So um, if you do have hardware that you would like to test, I'm willing to, you know, have a chat and like uh, uh, give you help uh, to run some of these tests or like something similar, give you ideas. Um, one of the cases uh, that is usually mentioned uh, as a difference between file systems is like how do they handle some special like extreme cases, right? So for example, what if there are like 100,000 um, files, right, in the data directory? Um, that would require a much larger table or like much larger number of tables or something like that because even um, Postgres creates like one gigabyte segment uh, segments for, for the relations. So even in these cases, it was like 
low hundreds of uh, files, right? So it's not like uh, hitting these limits. So that's very interesting. I don't know how to test that uh, reasonably. And uh, of course, there is a question of different workloads. I, I did some uh, uh, as much as possible to test the two extremes, like OLTP and analytics, like OLTP small transactions and large bulk uh, uh, reads and writes. But maybe um, there needs to be like a mixed workload and it would behave differently. I don't know. So I'll, th that's what I plan to do. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. Hi, thank you, Thomas, for the talk. Uh, you didn't mention the number of clients you were using to benchmark, so maybe it's not important, but I wonder what was right. the scale, because even for, even for the dump. Right, so uh, I did uh, use like the number of cores multiplied by two, I think. So it's like, it's not thousands, it's maybe like 64, 128, um, at least on the larger machine. On the smaller machine, which only has four cores, I, I think I used, I think I used like uh, uh, 32, right? So it's, yeah. Um, the, the write and read patterns between PGWAL and the main data and the database folders is completely different. Did you use at least two partitions to do the tests, like one partition for PGWAL and a second partition for the database file? Yes, so, so the question is like whether it would be, whether I have considered like um, separating the different parts of the database, uh, like um, transaction log and the data directory on different devices. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I did consider that, I, I didn't do that in the test, but it's essentially what I mentioned, what I included um, in, the, in the note about like different configurations. Um, same, it's the same idea as moving, uh, you know, um, some of the parts of the ZFS to a separate device. But I do agree, um, yes, that's another option that could be tested, yes. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, my question is about the trim operation. So on modern SSDs, we can write a block, read a block, but there's also a trim. And in your experiments, did you run into any problems with this operation, like specifically for the XT4 file system? So I'm sorry, I, I don't know what the dream is. Trim operation tells a solid state device. Oh, you mean trim? Trim, trim. Oh, um, I didn't run into any problems. I did some basic tuning on the file systems. Uh, I think the trim was uh, enabled in the mount options. So if there was a problem, it's visible in the data or it should be visible in the data, right? Um, I, I didn't see any like immediate differences between the file systems in this. So I'm, I don't know, I, I can check. If you have something like um, that I should look for, I would be grateful for the information. Um, yes, we actually once had an incident because of this. Yeah, I mean like, um, I, I'm sure that uh, like you know propagating these kind of like um, information through the uh, through the multiple layers of the file system uh, management can be a problem yes were uh, when you used uh, x4 did you use data write back or was it the default i think i used the default configurations um, if you have ideas like which other options configurations to use i'm happy to do that it will run for a couple you know, days or something. I actually, I, I killed one of the SSDs uh, doing these tests. Um, so, but I'm happy to do, I'm happy to do that again. Um, okay. Well, we're out of time. Okay. So, um, first of all, you know, the conference is organized by the volunteers and I would like to give you, give him an applause because he's one of the main people who was in Prague. <laughs> <laughs>